I'm going to talk a little bit about IT. Um, the conventional wisdom on IT, from one point of view, is that it's absolutely wonderful. It can do nothing wrong, uh, and really it's the main factor in society nowadays, and it's the thing that's propelling most other developments. And um, it's quite interesting, if you do, your, uh, you do your history, you'll find out how long this idea has been going around. Um, and in fact, the stress put on information, the stress put on knowledge, on skill, uh, on communications, on electronics, and all of these things, is a very common feature of most of the theories of the future, uh, which you have to mug up on if you're going to profess in forecasting. So you can see that Fritz Macklart, 50 years ago, Peter Drucker, the main guru of American management theory, were already talking about knowledge, and moving out of the manufacturing view of the world was Daniel Bell. And over the years, most recently with Jeremy Rifkin, who believes that the whole world is going to move towards generating its own energy at home, downloading uh, designs from the internet, and then making 3D products in a garage, if you have a garage, uh, those things are all testimony to the power of IT in visions of the future. And to mention these is not even to mention really the founder of the school in some ways, Marshall McLuhan, um, who believed that it, uh, what he called electric technology was really as powerful a revolution in society as uh, the Gutenberg printing press. And he outlined that view in a whole series of books. Um, it's really interesting when people celebrate so many things about IT today, how far these ideas go back. Is it true? Well, um, if you... Uh, look at the people, you get a bit bored by the theories. Uh, if you look at Howard Rheingold, the idea of communities of interest rather than of geography, smart mobs where you topple uh, Indonesian regimes just because you've texted people, uh, net smart where IT is always intelligent and smart and dignifying and wonderful, and then uh, the biggest claim really made by Al Gore that IT uh, in a regime of netizens improves and enriches democracy. Ah, it's a powerful claim. And you can go to the Spanish left in the shape of Manuel Castells and his Rise of the Network Society book, which was a great bestseller in academic circles, and beyond in 1997. And the defect of it all is, is you put on the IT spectacles and then everything seems to conform to your vision. What we're capturing in this is one aspect of the development of society. You could say, well, look, peak oil is the main event in the future. You could say, well, um, the biotech revolution, as Jeremy Rifkin said earlier, is really the main event. But IT tends to dominate the discussion. And the claims go further. One of the most ridiculous ones of the last couple of years is that IT and Facebook drove the Arab Spring. And in fact, if you go to Mark Zuckerberg, he had a very clever judgment on all of this, um, which is... Uh, Facebook was neither necessary nor sufficient to make the Arab Spring. Coming from Zuckerberg, that's a reasonably good critique. He, I think, put the emphasis on the people, the politics, uh, or maybe the lack of politics and lack of leaders led to some of the chaos that we see today. But to say that Facebook drove it uh, would be too self-indulgent. So we have all these views of IT. And and one of the most important ones, no speech is complete without a reference to Steve Jobs. He clearly was a saint, uh, you know, and uh, um, walked on water and did all the other stuff. So there's that. And then another claim made for IT is that WikiLeaks and all of this stuff uh, brings about a whole new transparency in the world, which has got to be good. You know, we need to know about David Cameron's uh, private bank balance. And then, if you believe Polly Toynbee on The Guardian, you should open your own accounts to the transparency initiative uh, of Julian Saint Assange. So, these are, you know, wonderful claims for it. But just one little um, fly in the ointment, which is if IT is really the propulsive force for the future of innovation, for society, for the way we live and work and so on, where we can talk successfully about the internet economy and all of these things, then why is it that not just Apple, with now getting on for uh, $100 billion worth of cash just running around the Apple offices, not being invested in new IT, but it's not just Apple. 
If you look at all of the main players in American IT and world IT, and you capture on the far right the ratio of their cash hoards to their market capitalization, we've got to ask ourselves, is innovation really driving forward and accelerating and doing all the wonderful things uh, because of IT that we thought it was? And you can see very clearly, I think, if you look at the numbers, that it speaks of a crisis of nerve about taking risks with new products and with innovation. You keep the cash yourself, you become a bit of a bank, you might use some of it for some mergers and acquisitions, but you don't try to get radically new products out of the door. You may be satisfied with the iPad. I am not, but then I was at Sussex in the 60s. <laughs> at the Science Policy Research Unit, in fact. So here's the opposite side of the case, which if you were a dialectician in the 60s, you had to consider. Uh, and that is that IT is all bad news, right? It's really messing us up. And the first claim that is made is by uh, Nicholas Carr, who I've debated before now. Um, and he's really saying that it makes us shallower. You don't read the main article. You certainly don't read a book from cover to cover. If I was to recommend this at Sussex, I know I would be dismissed as an authoritarian fascist. But uh, you don't even read the screen, because what you do is you look at the tweets and the other stuff. I'll do it backwards for you, uh, like that. So he says, really, it's dumbing us down. Um, uh, there's another problem, which is uh, these are the sorts of things you meet in London hotel rooms, but they also infect the internet bugs and uh, all of these sorts of things. And the latest incident which has been talked about is not just Stuxnet, Israel socking it to Iran, it's the closing down of an American power station in New Jersey because a bug messed up the uh, software for that installation. So we are dumber, we are more vulnerable to attack, and we're also more vulnerable according to the top policy wonk uh, in Britain, Charles Leadbeater, um, we're vulnerable to invasions of our privacy, vulnerable to the big four, that's uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. He notably trendy, he leaves out Microsoft, which as we know is a spent force, uh, and um, says, you know, they're always looking over your shoulder and all of these things, these cloud capitalists. So really the surveillance society, which actually was first discussed by Vance Packard in 1965, all about the invasion of privacy and so on, but it's still minted as new as a big sort of downside and critique uh, of IT. Well, what both accounts forget, ladies and gentlemen, is that the world is not just defined by autonomous innovations coming out of Silicon Valley reaching us as grateful consumers or uh, as consumers who are being tracked everywhere we go through Tesco and through customs and all these sorts of things. The main difference that IT has made, which we so easily forget, is to business to business transactions and more importantly to business and government investment in manufacturing, services, uh, extractive industries, construction, agriculture, and all of these things. It's the nitty-gritty down-home machine tools side of IT and the service equivalents of that. The fact that if you uh, put an RFID tag on a uh, mobile x-ray machine, you actually save a nurse's time locating it in the hospital all the time uh, because 9% of them uh, of the machines are not tracked in the hospital and nobody knows where they are. It's those sorts of productivity differences that IT makes and uh, in our rather complacent world today we tend to neglect them. It's the contribution that robots can make to cars and how much IT has to do with all of that. Now why is it that we don't talk about that essential and uh, you know very important aspect of IT which is neither utopian nor dystopian but it's what's going down. And part of the reason is, is in the West at least, we do not value, for all the talk about IT, genuine research and development and putting the money into it that we saw already was absent in all of these cash hoards. This is a woman who is in charge. She's a commissioner for innovation at the EU. None of you voted for her. None of you know who she is. But she did strike one proper note. She says that in the EU and in the West, uh, really, she could be saying, we face an innovation emergency. And if you look at the numbers, this is from the OECD, Main Science and Technology Indicators, is what they have for breakfast at Spru uh, today. I'm sure you all have it over your cornflakes. You'll see that business expenditure on R&D as a proportion of gross domestic product has been inclining up a little bit, but in the EU's case, certainly, we're still looking at 
under 2% of GDP spent on investing in the future and on innovation. And if you look at the government picture, it's very much worse. Big decline and closure of many government labs uh, and these sorts of things. Now, of course, we know from the Japanese example that if you double the expenditure on R&D, you can still enjoy not one but two lost decades, which is what they've had in Japan. So there's no guarantee about it. As Einstein said, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research. But you know also that if you carry on at the EU level, 1% or less than 1% if you look at the government contribution for the West, you carry on not spending any money on these things, then there's one result that is certain, unlike the world of research, that you are not going to innovate. And it's interesting, you can't follow all the lines on this one, but if you see the ascending one, who've gone from 0.5% of gross domestic product to 1.5% of gross domestic product just since the 90s. Was it something I said that made you laugh? Or was it the China thing? Now, well, I'm sorry about the lines. I didn't make them, but the China one is pretty unmistakable. Uh, you know, they're really heading up there, and they're going to be overtaking the EU pretty soon. China isn't everywhere, as we know, because if you look at the China line here, they're spending 1.7% of GDP on research and development, not available, their defence or non-defence components, <coughs> but the, uh, the only 5% of what they're spending on R&D is on basic research, blue skies research, just looking at science and not looking for commercial results especially. If you look at the US, which is pretty good, they're doing uh, a fraction of the non-defence fraction at 81% shows what a large amount they do spend on defence R&D, but they are spending a very creditable 19% of their R&D effort on basic research. So China has a bit of catching up in that regard. So really, you know, you look at the numbers, you look at BP, 0.2% of their revenues they spend on thinking about the future. Is that why Deepwater Horizon happened by any chance? Royal Mail, 0.1%. Every thousand pounds they get in, they spend a pound thinking about the future. Is that why the postman looks so pissed off in the, in the morning? Because nothing happening in Royal Mail. You know, so, you know, I'm not saying just double it. I'm saying we can't go on like this. We need more ambition. And if we're talking ambition, go to the elevator company, the lift company, signing in Hangzhou in China. You'll see that they make 44 different kinds of escalators, including the sort that make you shop more because you have to cross the floor of Debenhams or wherever it is to get to the next one. And you think, well, 44 escalators, they sell them at US dollars, 15,000 to 25,000 dollars each. It's all pretty humdrum stuff. But take a look, contact now. You see that, bu uh, that button there? Just to the bottom left to it, add to basket. Add to basket. So if you, you want eight escalators, click on that. <laughs> you like this one? Maybe you'd like that one. You know, like Amazon does. Right? I mean, ambition. You know, you just and then they presumably come in a forklift truck to your door uh, the next day with some cardboard on it that you find hard to open. So, you know, none of this is to credit the Co Chinese Communist Party. That's a different story. But it is to say that they do think big out there. And, uh, you know, there's, there's something in that for us to learn. And when we return to the world of IT, these are the displays that they're working on. In Tiananmen Square, when you land uh, in, from the airport, you go to Tiananmen Square, square you get more airport. Um, you get the Stalinist loudspeakers telling you what to think. Um, but you've got some pretty impressive, you know, uh, full screen views there. And the guy behind it, is uh, Lu Zheng Gang on the right. He hasn't died in a Chongqing hotel room, as far as I'm aware, um, with some familiar friends. He's the Bill Gates of China making all of those wonderful displays. And you look at what's happening in India. Um, they are adding on these mobile subscriptions very fast. You know that. You should know, I probably do know, that they've already made a mobile phone with a battery life of 30 days. So they are not holding back in innovation. And they've still everything to play for. They've got a long way to go, but they are taking it more seriously. And if you think that's impressive, then take a look at this US patent filed by Infosys in 2007 it's to take a mobile phone and make holographic projections in 3D of what you were doing in your bedroom with your partner last night. Right? And no doubt it'll be played London to Brighton, Brighton to London on the train compartment walls. Can we handle it? Yes. Uh, are they pioneering it? I hope so. So a mobile phone that's also a projector in 3D, that is innovation. So I just want to say that 
we tend to underestimate how difficult innovation is. We tend to neglect the romance of it. We get off on our iPads and the consumer face of IT without situating IT in the wider context of biology, of energy, of materials, and of all the other things that make up the society that we do. By coquetting with the consumer sides of IT, we're neglecting the drift, the complacency, and the conservatism of Western society and its commitment to research. And one of the aspects of conservatism I just want to end on is what this guy so brilliantly challenged just over 50 years ago, Yuri Gagarin. Here's the official picture. Here's the real man. If you actually follow what happened in the space race, the Soviets put up like a dog, and they said, oh, well, that worked. Uh, well, we'll put a man up a fortnight later. So they did that. And what is not so widely known, it's on my website if you read the article, is that they had no experience of weightlessness in the Soviet Union. They did not know whether he was going to live or die. They had no idea about it. They didn't have those American planes that do that stuff. They had a horrid lift in central Moscow uh, where you puked your guts out when you'd been on the experiment. That's all they knew. So he went into the unknown not knowing whether he would live or die. And to his credit, Kennedy said two weeks after Gagarin went up, we've got to put a man on the moon. And he told his cabinet, I don't care who does it, who gets us to the moon. It can be the janitor down the hall as long as he gets us to the moon. It's a terrific thing to say. So that was a race. Their innovation was taken seriously. We now know, of course, that nobody did land on the moon. <laughs> uh, and we also know it was all a bit military and all of that. But nevertheless, in terms of ambition, in terms of entering the unknown, and the Indians, as you know, have found water on the moon, which allowed them to overtake the Chinese uh, for a bit. That is terrific. So where's it all leading? We need to drop the West's manic, depressive, utopian, dystopian fascination with consumer IT. Right? Consumer IT has got lots to offer. It's not a genuine innovation revolution. And if you think it is, you must be under 21. Uh, the second thing is, we need to revive ambition in every kind of R&D, research and development, especially the basic research, the one that's neglected in the government's policy that you must have an instrumental attitude to research at Sussex. When you put in a research proposal, you've got to say what economic impact it will make, even before you've done the research. This is really brilliant. Right? No, we don't know where we're going in research. That's what it qualifies it as research. That's what we must do. And finally, and most importantly, revive the will to enter the unknown. We've got to do that. And at the moment, we fear so many things that we're just losing that mojo of wanting to go there. So join me to take innovation forward and let's hold our leaders to account about the crisis in innovation, R&D, and IT in the West. Thank you. <laughs>